invite our ushers to go ahead and come forward at this time, and we're going to continue to worship the Lord with our, our giving. Man, are you glad to be here, church? Y'all are worshiping Jesus, like, really well. Uh, and that's, man, that's just awesome. Uh, and thank you for being here. I know uh, that I'm, I'm excited for tonight, but I'm, I'm really excited for the next three nights, okay? Uh, and so... We have most of you in the room, our Calvary Church family, and then we've got some that are visiting with us tonight, and we're so glad that you're here, and we're thankful that you're here. Uh, and please come back tomorrow night, because we're going to have Pastor Ethan Rouse, who is right there on the front row, bringing the word tomorrow. And then on Tuesday night, we'll have Pastor Ryan Sawyer sitting right there in the front row, the blend. How do I get a blend shirt, Pastor Ryan? Do I got to go to the blend? That's the name of his student ministry, and he's doing an awesome job down there in Madison, just like Pastor Ethan's doing an awesome job in Decatur. And then on Wednesday night, we'll all be in here again uh, as Justin Sawyer brings the word and closes it all out for us, okay? And so I encourage you to just be here uh, as many nights as you possibly can and, uh, and just be praying for these guys, you know, as they bring the word, because I know God's given them something to share uh, with our students and with this body for this time. And uh, so be praying uh, for them. I want to pray over our offering, and then we're going to have a little skit. just want you to check out, um, and, uh, and then we'll go from there. Okay, Father, thank you for what you're doing in this room. I ask, Lord, that you would uh, just continue to have your will and have your way in this place. God, let us not be distracted by anything in this room other than you. God, as we give our tithe and we give our offering right now, Lord, I pray that you bless our lives. All for your glory in the name of Jesus. Amen, church. So, Jesus, I just, I don't trust you. Well, I mean, like, I want to trust you. I just don't. Even though I don't? Yeah. Okay. All right. Jesus. Yes, Jesus. I trust you. Okay. All right. Are you going to catch me? <laughs> but you see, that's the part I'm worried about. Okay. Yes, Jesus. I trust you. Yes, Jesus, I trust you. Right. Jesus, you caught me! I didn't think you were going to catch me, but then you caught me! Yes. Round two, okay. Okay, okay, okay. Front word fall, I can do that. Okay, yeah. Yep. Yes, Jesus, I trust you so much. Are you serious? Okay, Jesus, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but there's nobody over here. <laughs> and you want me to fall? But Jesus, I, <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> no, no, I can't. But I, um, I won't. All right, church. Do you have your Bibles? I would love to see it if you've got your Bible. You can put it in there and be happy that you have a Bible. All right. Uh, why don't you turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Again, church, thank you for being here. I know it means a lot to the students that you'd show up. It means a lot to me that you would as well to support these students because I love them. And I want you to love them too. <laughs> Do you love our students, church? Come on. We're getting there. <laughs> Luke chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 50. And then I'll give you some context. Okay. 
Luke chapter 1, verse 50. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says this. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. And I love how Eugene Peterson puts it in the message. It says this. His mercy flows in wave after wave. Everyone say wave after wave. His mercy flows in wave after wave on those who are in awe before him. The title of the message tonight, if you're taking notes, is Be Like Mary. Be Like Mary. Let's pray over our text. Father, thank you for your word. We know it's a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. And I ask God that as we dive into your word over these next couple of minutes, Lord, that you would illuminate this place, that you would illuminate any dark spaces in our heart, in our mind, in our spirit, that we may be changed to be more like Jesus who is the light of the world, and uh, we just want to be like you, Lord. And so we're opening up our mind and our ears and our hearts right now and asking that you would please change us in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, hey, real quick, I do want to welcome, uh, we've got this thing going live on the internet. Do you want to just wave or, or like give it up for all the people that are watching live stream right now? That's pretty cool. Uh, and I, I know uh, Pastor Ethan, uh, he asked me the other day, he said, hey, are, are, are these services going to be live? Are they going to be online? I said, yeah, absolutely, they're going to be online. Uh, and he said, that's great because on Wednesday night I want to live stream TNT conference at my youth group. And so I think that's pretty cool. And, and it was funny because at the time Isaiah was like, actually, I think it was like an hour later, he was like, hey, man, we're not going to be able to live stream the conference. And I'm like, well, here's the deal. <laughs> We need to. And so thank you, Isaiah and Nolan, for making that happen tonight. You're amazing. All right. So a little context for our passage right here is uh, there is uh, this, this right here, what we just read in verse 50, was said by Mary, who ends up being the mother of Jesus just a few months after she says this. And, and Mary, most Christian Bible scholars believe that at the time, Mary was about 15 or 16 years old when all of this is taking place. And so she is, like if she was coming to Calvary Church, she would be in TNT, all right? And so this is, uh, this is a, an incredible experience that Mary is engaged in right here with the Lord. And it's really this, uh, this crossroads of, am I going to do what God is calling me to do or am I not? Is God going to have to call somebody else? Okay, because God's always going to push forward with his plan. He likes to use us, and he wants to use us. But if he's got to get somebody else, he will. He'll do it. Because at the end of the day, this story is not about me, and it's not about you. It's all about him and all about his glory. And so Mary is at this point as a young teenager where she has this encounter with the Lord, and she has an opportunity to say yes to Jesus or to say no to Jesus, like literally say yes to Jesus or literally say no to Jesus, okay? And so what happens here in Luke chapter 1 is that Mary is visited by an angel. The angel tells Mary that she's going to become pregnant. She's going to end up giving birth to uh, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And she's freaking out about it. She's asking questions about it. But in the end, she says yes to Jesus. But I want to talk about how she got there because it wasn't an immediate yes for Mary. And if most of us are being honest in the room, it's not always an immediate yes from us either. We've got questions, and we've got things that we want to get we want to get figured out. But this passage here, after she says yes, she kind of sings this song of praise to the Lord, and she says, "Oh my soul, or oh how my soul praises the Lord! How my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for He took notice of this lowly servant girl, and and from now on all generations." will call me blessed, for the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. And then verse 50, his mercy flows in wave after wave on those who are in awe before him. You know, just that little uh, passage there and that little phrase, wave after wave, uh, I I was actually studying for this message back in uh, in January uh, in preparation to preach uh, this message at our uh, young adult ministry called The Wave. And so this makes a lot of sense now that I'm talking about waves. And so I I preached it in February uh, at at, at The Wave, but I couldn't shake it uh, that that God wanted me to share this tonight. In fact, I had another message prepared and ready to go. And I was telling Pastor Ethan about this today. And and, uh, and I said, but I'm going to push the Lord to let me do the one I want to do. 
And, uh, and Ethan was basically like, well, good luck with that. And so then this afternoon, I was just like, gave it one last shot of God, can I please preach out of Isaiah chapter 43? That's where I want to be. I've got a word for it, and I'm excited. And he said, absolutely not. And I said, okay, yes, sir. <laughs> and, so, and so here we are in Luke chapter 1, because I just cannot shake this and get this out of my brain. I think it's timely maybe for our church and in particular for students, okay? But the phrase wave after wave got me thinking about waves, and how waves are formed. I mean, it's cool to see waves. I've never really experienced like a hardcore wave. I've never gone surfing. Hello, I live in Missouri. And also, I'm not interested in going surfing because I'm not a great swimmer, and I could, I could probably drown and die. And I don't want to do that. And so, uh, I, you know, we don't live near a coast, uh, but we do have some ponds and some creeks and stuff like that around here. We can kind of see some see some waves. And so I was thinking a while back, man, how are waves created? And I probably learned this in school, but I don't remember it. And so sorry to all the teachers uh, in here uh, if, you know, students don't remember stuff, all right? Because they basically remember it so they can pass the test and then it's gone, <laughs> all right, forever. And so I was wondering, how are waves created? And what I thought, the way that I thought waves were created, and don't judge me because you may be in here tonight like, no, th I, that's what I thought too, was the way I thought waves were created was maybe one of two things. Number one, that there was, that it had something to do with the moon. Um, and like, you know, because it can, kinda, the moon kind of like helps uh, regulate like tides and stuff like that. You understand, like, is, am, am I already getting beyond you? Like, I went to college, but I dropped out, okay? Like, no, the moon, like, helps kind of regulate the tides and the pool on the ocean and the currents and that sort of stuff. And, like, there's, some, there's like, science fact that. And that's kind of what I thought, way, how waves were created, but that, that wasn't it. And the other way that I thought waves were maybe created was, like, if there is, um, like, an earthquake underneath the water and it made waves. It's kind of what I thought happened. Neither of those things are true. Does anybody know how waves are created? Gravity? It's not the moon. That's what I thought. Huh? Wind. That's it. It's just wind. And I was like, oh, it's just wind whenever I looked it up. And boy, but I kept, like, reading about it and, like, studying on it and just thinking about how wind creates waves. And, and it, there's really like three key factors uh, to, to how the wind creates the waves. And, and, it's, and these are the three things. First is how hard the wind is blowing, okay? So like the harder the wind, the greater the wave, all right? The second is like the duration of the wind. And so how long the wind is blowing. If it's blowing for 30 seconds, probably going to be a little ripple, little wave. If it's blowing for a long time, uh, it's going to be a crazy big wave and do some, do some uh, uh, you know, destruction, okay? Uh, and then the third factor was how much surface area the wind has to work with. And the more surface area that the wind is going over the water, the greater the wave. All right, so it's like, it's, it's, it's how hard, how long, and how much surface area, and that determines the wave. And so basically, it's this, no wind, no wave. Like, if there's no wind blowing, there's no wave created, all right? But the more wind there is, the more wave there is. You know, I think it's important for us as believers to pray for the wind. And I'm not talking about the <laughs> blow, the wind out there, because that'd be totally weird. And I don't know, maybe you pray that in your own time, and that's whatever, it's between you and God, but uh, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is we need to pray for the wind of the Holy Spirit to just fill us up and to fill up this house right here. Because more wind, more wave, more power, more influence, okay? And, 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 and this is uh, scriptural here. Because the, uh, the Holy Spirit is actually, uh, uh, you know, compared to a wave, or not a wave, the wind a couple of times in the Word of God. Uh, we see it here in Acts chapter 2. If you want to, like, flip over there, you can. We'll uh, read this real quick. But in Acts chapter 2, after Jesus had ascended into heaven, he, uh, he told his uh, disciples to go off and wait for him. And, hey, I'm going to send you a gift. And don't you dare leave uh, until I give you that gift. And the gift is going to be the Holy Spirit. And it says this in Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty, what? Wind. A mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. 
Then what looked like tongues of uh, tongues, flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with what? The Holy Spirit. And they began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. And so there's this comparison when like this gift of the Holy Spirit that Jesus had promised while he was walking with his disciples, that would be, you know, God with us. Right, right. Whenever, whenever Jesus left our side, he sent his Holy Spirit. And you understand that it was better for Jesus to go to heaven so that he could send his Holy Spirit, right? Because now, like, like Jesus in the flesh, he can only walk with so many people. But Holy Spirit can live on the inside of us and go with all of us whenever we go home tonight, okay? Same God everywhere we go. And so it's a good thing that Jesus went to heaven so that he could send us the promised Holy Spirit. And then going all the way back to Luke chapter 1. And this encounter uh, between Mary and an angel, when, when the angel's given the, uh, you know, this promise of, hey, you know, God's wanting to use you to bring forth the Messiah into the world. And Mary says in verse 35, well, how is this going to happen? Verse 34, how can this happen? I'm a virgin. And verse 35, the angel says, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The wind is going to come upon you. And church, I believe we need more Holy Spirit. I believe we need to follow the Holy Spirit a whole lot better than we do. I believe we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Mary and her willingness to say yes right here in this moment, she was filled up with the wind, and Mary ended up being one of the greatest wave makers in all the world. In fact, she gave birth to the ultimate wave maker in Jesus Christ, okay? And so, and so uh, for all of us, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But here's the thing about a wave. Like, it's not the wind hits, hits the water, and all of a sudden there's a massive wave. It starts as just a little, a little ripple, a little ripple, a little ripple. And so I just wanted you to think tonight, man, how much surface area are you giving the Holy Spirit to work in your life? Like, if you'll give him some more surface area, man, and, and just let him come hard, come long, like, come Holy Spirit, then your life will create waves. But it starts as a ripple. And so if you're maybe in this place tonight where you've said yes to Jesus, and maybe you've, you know, been following Jesus for years and years and years, but you haven't really been following all the ways of the Holy Spirit, and just tuning in to him, maybe tonight can be a night where you take a little bit from this message on how did Mary do it, and we can apply it to our lives when we walk out of this place and we create more ripples, because ultimately that's what I think God wants us to do. He wants us to go out in this community and not just be like calm and not like, you know, cause any kind of disturbance. No, he wants us to go out like a wave, because ultimately he wants to reach our community in wave after wave with his mercy, and he's going to use us to do it. And so there's a couple things I want you to write down. If if you're taking notes on, on how Mary did this, and we see this here in Luke chapter 1, and if you just take one of these tonight and you apply it to your life, I think that, that your life will be better and different tomorrow because you do it. Number one is this. Eliminate the excuses. Eliminate the excuses. Be like Mary. Eliminate the excuses. Um, so she says here in verse 35, 34 and 35, says, Mary asked the angel, how can this happen I am a virgin. And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Now, now I'm looking at this and I'm like, I don't know. That's a pretty good excuse on why you can't do what God's calling you to do. Because uh, here's the context. God's calling Mary to give birth to a baby. And she's like, that's great. But here's the problem. And you probably know this because you're God. But I'm a virgin. I'm a virgin. You know, and I, I think back to that, that Forrest Gump clip where he's just like, I am not a smart man, you know. And I'm like, I'm, in, I'm there. I'm like, I'm not a smart man. But even I can put this together and be like, yeah, I don't know, God. I don't know how this is going to work. But then the angel gives her the answer. and says, well, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. You know, I think that there are too many excuse makers <laughs> on why we can't do what God is calling us to do. No matter what your age is, whether you're a teenager or you're a senior adult, it does not matter. I think we make way too many excuses. And I, and I absolutely believe this, that those who make excuses will never make a difference. That if you want to make a, a difference, you've got to stop 
making excuses on why you can't do the things that God is telling you that you can do. And so I just want to ask you tonight, what are your excuses? Like maybe you've been holding on to a calling for like 10 years, maybe five years, maybe 40 years, and, and you know that God has called you to do something. Why haven't you done it yet? You understand that our time on this planet is awfully short. We had, had two funerals this past week to, for two great men in our church. And I, just, and, and I just thought, man, time goes fast. And we played that, that testimony clip from a couple weeks ago from, from George Starkey. And he was talking about how the older you get, the faster it goes. Can anybody, anybody attest to that in the room? Like, I'm only 30 now. I'm not old by any means, but I really feel like it's flying by. Right, Cassie? Fast. Like, me and Cassie were in kindergarten together. And now we worship together, and we never would have thought it's that would It's flying by, right, Cassie? But I'm like, we're 30 already. Chelf, yes. we're 30. Like, me and Cassie were in we're kindergarten together. And it's weird. And now we worship together, and we never would have thought it's that would It's flying by, by right, Cassie? But I'm like, we're 30 then. already. Chelf, yes. we're 30. Like, me and Cassie were in we're kindergarten together. But and it's weird. And now we worship together, and we never would have thought It's flying by, right, Cassie? But I'm like, we're 30 already. Chelf, we're 30. Like, me and Cassie were in kindergarten together. And it's weird. And now we do worship together and we never love exactly. It's flying by, right, Cassie? I'm like, what? Excuses, and that's how the Holy Spirit will get a little more in your life. Number two, if you want to write this down, is listen to the Lord. Listen to the Lord. Backing up a couple That's verses. how the Holy Spirit will get Verse a little more Gabriel in your Mary life. Number two, said, if you want to write this down, is listen to the Lord. Woman. Listen the to the Lord. Lord is with you. Backing up a couple That's verses. how the Holy Spirit will get a little more Gabriel says, Gabriel been disturbed. <laughs> Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. And like, he wasn't speaking in a different language. Like, he was speaking the way she could understand. And all he said was, hey, greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. And Mary's like. Uh, what? Because sometimes when God's speaking to you, it can be scary. It can be confusing. It can maybe even disturb you because maybe he's calling you to do something that's way out of your comfort zone. But listen to the Lord. And a lot of times God's not going to speak in the spectacular. Sometimes it's going to be in the stillness, in the quietness, in the shh. Man, I was thinking about Elijah this afternoon. In 1 Kings chapter 18, chapter 19, some pretty impressive passages of Scripture. I mean, it would have been an amazing thing to be there on Mount, Mount Carmel whenever, uh, you know, Elijah called down fire from heaven and, and just killed all the prophets of Baal. Like, that would have been an amazing thing to see. But then right after that, this amazing, like, like, uh, like uh, incredible act of God that Elijah was a massive part of, he gets word that Jezebel wants to kill him, and so he starts to run. And he goes, and he just wears out, and he goes into this cave, and, and God's like, hey, Hey, what, you know, what are you doing here? And, 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 and just let Elijah know, hey, I want to speak to you. And so go outside the cave. And so Elijah peeks out of the cave, and it says this uh, in, in 1 Kings chapter 19, that there was a sound of a mighty windstorm, like so strong that like even rocks were going out of place. But the Lord was not in the wind. And then it says that there was this great earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then there was this fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And then right after the fire, there was this whisper, and it was the Lord. And I love what God says. He says, Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And Elijah's like, well, uh, and he's like, no, listen. <laughs> and right there in that stillness, in the quiet, not in the spectacular, God gave Elijah the instructions that he needed moving forward. He said, hey, go back the way that you just came. And then he lays out what he needs to do, anointing this king and on and on and on. You know, maybe you're here tonight and you're like, I try to listen to the Lord, but I don't really feel like I'm hearing anything. Don't be afraid of the silence. <laughs> don't be afraid of that. Like divine silence doesn't mean divine inactivity. Just because God's not speaking and you're not like hearing it doesn't mean that, that God's not there. Greetings, favored woman. Greetings, favored man. The Lord is with you, confused and disturbed. Mary wondered what the Lord, or wondered what this might mean. You know, uh, John chapter 10 and verse 27, Jesus is talking. He's talking about his people, and he refers to his people as sheep. And he says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. You know, I'm thankful back in 
in 2007. I was in my second semester of my first year of college and my only year of college. And, uh, and, and, and I remember just God starting to speak to me and like pull me back home and just push me back home. And some of you know that story, so I'm not going to go all into it. And then I ended up having a conversation with my wife, Chelsea, and, and we ended up just being like, yeah, God is leading us to go back home. And it was one of these moments, you know, where it's, it was this stillness kind of thing almost where God was like, Andy, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I'm in Bible college. Like, this is good, right? This is a great thing. Like when I see you, I'll be like, here's my degree. No, all of that did not matter at all. But I'm so thankful in 2007, just a still small voice just kind of leading me home. And it seemed kind of kind of unknown at the time that I was just like, okay, yes, Lord, I'll follow you, even though I have no idea how this is going to work out. I don't know of a church that's going to want to hire a, uh, a pastor who dropped out of Bible college. I just don't think that works. But I'm going to trust you on it, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go, and the Lord has led the way. You know, whenever we lean into the, to his voice, we will learn what his vision is for our life when we just lean into that. And so I want to I encourage you tonight to listen to the Lord. Why? Because when he's speaking to you, he will lead you into the plan that he has for you. And that's the third thing I want you to write down is participate in the plan. Just participate in the plan. This is his story, not our story, right? Participate in the plan. So confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. And then verse 30 in Luke chapter 1. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. And he will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. That's amazing, okay? That's like, okay, I heard you, God. Say that one more time because that was really cool, you know? And I wonder, was she confused and disturbed at the end of that? I don't know. But I also wonder this. Man, she was, she's 15, 16 years old. She's about to get married to this really hot guy named Joseph. And, and I wonder if in the moment she was like, man, that's kind of going to ruin my plans. Like, I, I thought, like, what were Mary's plans for Mary's life? What were they? Like, were they to, you know, like... Uh, have kids normal, <laughs> you know, like not the Holy Spirit, you know, getting me pregnant. Like it'd be Joseph, me and Joseph. I really like Joseph and, and I think he likes me and like, and we will, you know, have 10 kids or, or a hundred kids like the McCutcheons and, 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 and we'll just, we'll, we'll enjoy, we'll maybe we'll move to Waco and we'll start like fixing houses and we'll get a TV show. I don't know what Mary's plan was for Mary's life, but I do know this. Whenever the Lord spoke to her, all of her plans went out the window, and she pressed in and participated in the plan that God had for her. You know, a lot of these plans that we make for our own lives, I mean, the book of Proverbs says, hey, a man plans his way, but the Lord orders his steps, all right? So we think that we're in control of our lives. We're really not. He really, really is. And I'm glad because I'm not very good when I'm in control at all. And, and I realize that. And so I'm thankful that the Lord will, will order my steps because a lot of my ideas about plans for my life are just good ideas, but they're not necessarily God ideas. See, there's a huge difference between a good idea and a God idea. And I think a lot of people are just living their lives based on their good ideas that they have, but they're not pressing into the God ideas, the dreams and the things that he wants them to fulfill. And I think that that settling should be uh, something that, that, that shouldn't be familiar in the body of Christ, but it is all too familiar. We need to participate in his plan for our lives. You know, uh, one of the most famous verses in all the Bible, and in particular when it comes to, you know, God's plans for our lives, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, right? Is anybody in this room just curious? It's like, that's my life verse. I love that verse. Okay, fantastic. There's a couple of you. That's amazing. And I'll read that. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. There are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. And that's great. I want a T-shirt with that. I want a coffee mug with that. All of that's amazing. But here's the context of that. And I've shared it before here at Calvary. And I just want to remind you of this again because that's cute and that's amazing when we just go, yeah, I'll take that one. That's really good. Now all the rest of my days, it's like, 
it's a future, and it's a hope, and it's good, and not disaster. And that is God's plan. But here's the context. Back up one verse. It says, this is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years. Now, pause. That's God speaking to his precious possession, his people, Israel, and saying, you're going to be slaves for 70 years. You're going to be somewhere that I don't really even want you to be for 70 years. You'll be in Babylon for 70 years, but then I will come and I will do for you all the good things I promised, and I will bring you home again. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. There are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. When we press in and we participate to the, uh, in the plans of God, we've got to take the good and the bad, okay, or the stuff that we perceive is bad. All right, because a lot of times we're going through fire, right? Pastor Cody, we'll go through some really, really hard times, and we're wondering, man, why is this so hot? Why is this so terrible right now? But it's because God's trying to do something in us in that fire, maybe burn something out of our lives in that fire so that we'll be better and more equipped to serve him on the other side of it. All right, so just participate in the plan that God has for you. Amen? Amen. Number, number, I don't even know what number this is. 500. Press into the promise. Write this down. Press into the promise. You've got to participate in the plan, then you've also got to press into the promise. Here was the promise that, that Mary got from the Lord. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? Verse 34. I'm a virgin. And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. And what's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and now is in her sixth month. You understand that God's a promise maker and a promise keeper, right? Like he's not going to say he's going to do something he never follows through. He always, always does it. And so what we're presented with right here in this text is two impossible situations and two amazing things are happening. And so we have Elizabeth, who's Mary's relative, and she's barren and she's old. She's not able to have children anymore, but because it was God's plan and a promise and they wanted to have a baby, all of a sudden Elizabeth is pregnant and she ends up giving birth to who? John the Baptist, John the Baptist, to prepare the way of the Lord, Jesus Christ, okay? And so the other impossible situation here is a virgin named Mary that is promised that she's going to become pregnant with the Savior of the world. And just this idea in these two impossible situations, and they both involve a baby, I think is highly significant when thinking about the promises of God. Because it takes time for a baby to grow. Do you hear me? Like it takes about nine, ten months for a baby to grow and develop. And I don't know what kind of like a promise you've gotten from the Lord. And maybe you're like, man, I've got a promise. I've got a word from God. And I want to see it like, like, let's go. Let's go, God. But it takes time for those things to develop. Because at the end of the day, if you rush it, you could wreck it. Do you hear me? So don't rush the promises of God. You know, it's good for us to have to wait to experience all the incredible things that God has for us. You know, it would be crazy. I remember, like, all three times when Chelsea told me that she was pregnant with our three children. And, uh, and two of them in the room. One of them's over there in the nursery right now. And uh, uh, I'm talking about you, Landry. Hey, girl. I love you. And then there's Judah. What's up, Judah? Hey, what's up? And then Joel's over there, and he's crazy. But but here's the, I remember every time when, when Chelsea told me that, that she was pregnant, and even the first time uh, when, when we got pregnant with Judah. And you know what would have been crazy if it was like, you know, she tells me on Monday, hey, I'm pregnant. I'm like, oh, my gosh, okay. And then on Tuesday we had the baby. <laughs> that, that would be nuts because we would not have time to prepare. We wouldn't have time to get ready. We wouldn't be able to buy a crib. I wouldn't be able to YouTube how to change diapers. None of that stuff would be able to happen if we didn't have the time between the promise and the delivery of the promise, okay? And so we need this time, not just so that we can get ourselves ready, but so that God can get us ready and so that God can get the promise 
ready. And so my question for you is this. What are you pregnant with? What kind of a promise? What kind of a dream? What kind of a calling do you have on the inside of you that you are pregnant with? Don't rush it again because you could wreck it. Wreck it. But when you're pregnant, just go through the process and let the baby grow. Because if the baby's born prematurely, it could cause problems. And so be patient. Be still, let the baby develop, and just trust that what God starts, he always finishes. What do we do in the meantime while we're pregnant with a promise? We jump forward to Luke chapter 1 and verse 45, where Elizabeth says to Mary, you are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. That's what we do in the waiting. We just press into that promise. I believe it with all my heart. Just like pastor was preaching this morning, I cannot see it with my eyes, but I believe it because I know I heard God speak. Amen. So press into the promise. The next thing is imagine the impossible. Imagine the impossible. And so we move on one verse here. You know, the angel says, hey, people used to say that Elizabeth was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now is now in her sixth month. In verse 37, it says, for nothing is impossible with God. Or some of your translations say, for the word of God will never, ever fail. So I want want you to imagine the impossible. I think we're really guilty a lot of times of trying to limit the limitless God. Uh, and, and we try to really box him in, but, you know, it's absolutely impossible to box God in. You know, I mean, if, if we wrote up on a board, like, all right, let's, 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 let's write tonight, like, all the things that, that are God, you know, like, and, like, here's the box, and let's, like, let's write everything in it. Like, we cannot do that. And I love the fact that through all eternity, we're going to constantly be learning more and more and more about our Creator, and it's always going to be interesting. It's always going to be amazing uh, because, uh, because he is a limitless God. Um, there's, a, there's a story that I really like about a preacher. His name is Perry Noble. And, uh, and how many of you are in this room, you're familiar with Perry Noble? You've heard his name before. You may not like him. That's fine. I do. Uh, but, uh, but anyways, he, back in 1999, um, he was eating lunch with one of his, his friends and, um, and he knew that, you know, he was a pastor at a church at the time and uh, like an associate pastor at like a small Southern Baptist church in South Carolina. And, and, uh, and, and, and he felt like, you know, God was calling him to do some other things. And, uh, and, and so he's out and he's eating lunch with, with his buddy one day and, and they're just having a conversation about ministry and all this. And his friend looks across the table at him and he says, you know, well, what would you attempt for God if you knew you couldn't fail? And Perry immediately said, I would start a church. And his friend looked back across the table at him and said, you're a coward if you don't. You're a coward if you don't. What would you attempt for God if you knew you couldn't fail? I want you to just think about that. Let's just sit on that for a second. What would you attempt for God if you knew you could not fail? And I'll just put it right back at you (laughs) like Perry's friend did. You're a coward if you don't. You feel that? I know. Because, hey, I feel it too. (laughs) I'm just tired of sissy Christianity. I'm sick of it. Like the, the world is sick of it. They're wanting to see us do incredible things for God. Why? Because they want in. They just need to see that it really is different. Like if the only thing different about our lives is that we attend church on Sundays, they're not coming. They're not interested. They've got to see that we are radically different with our lives. That any way the Holy Spirit blows us, we go. Even if it doesn't make sense, we just go. And we just trust him. Why? Because nothing is impossible with God. The word of God will never, ever fail. And so Perry went from that lunch meeting right then to a couple weeks later, he started a Bible study with, I think, 16 people in, 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 at the end of, uh, in January of 2000. And then over the course of the next uh, 16 years, uh, his 16-person Bible study grew to a 33,000-person church in South Carolina. You can do exactly what God's calling you to do. And you don't have to worry about what anybody else thinks other than him. So just imagine the impossible. And listen, man, this isn't just for teenagers. This is for some of you who have your own businesses. This is for some of you who are close to retirement. If you're feeling like you've settled, 
You still got time left. You still got it. Don't worry about the money. Don't worry about making all the bills work. If you'll do what he says, he will provide all that you need. Man, I wish the place would have just got shut down with amens on that. I know. But we're like, I think that's true. (laughs) No, friends, it is true. It is. So just imagine the impossible things that God could do with your life because he wants to do it. And by the way, his thoughts are so much higher and his ways are so much higher than yours. All right. And the last thing I want to share with you, how to be like Mary, how to kind of start a ripple effect in your own life, is you got to risk your reputation. What everyone else thinks about you. Whenever God's calling you to do something, a lot of times it's not going to make any sense. And, you're, and you're, one of your first things is going to be like, well, what are people going to say? What are they going to do? Who cares? If you're following Jesus, who cares? You've got to risk your reputation. And so the angel presents Mary with all of this, you know, incredible promise about Jesus being the Savior of the world. And then at the end of it, Mary says this in verse 38. I am the Lord's servant. May everything that you've said about me come true. And then the angel left her. (laughs) Man, when's the last time you took a risk for Jesus? When's the last time you did something a little bit out of your routine for Jesus? I want to encourage you tonight, just like Mary, just simply say yes to Jesus no matter what he's telling you. Say yes to Jesus. And and know that you're not too small to do something big for God. Teenagers, do you hear me? You're not too small to do something big for God. You know, Mary was here in this little town called Nazareth, and, you know, and then Jesus is referred to later in life as Jesus of Nazareth. And one of the things that said about Naz- Nazareth is kind of like Mark Juan. They're like, you know, I'm just joking for all you Mark Juan people. Uh, they're like, well, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good? And, yeah, actually the Savior of the world uh, did. And this is, th- this is kind of Mary's thing. And I wonder if she's just like, man, I'm kind of small. And I'm in this small, like, place where people don't really pay much attention to But you know what? I think that our lives are a lot like seeds, like God has planted us where he wants us. You know, it's interesting that you're here in 2018, like you could have been back in 1818, you know? Maybe some of you would have really liked that. I don't know. Or you could have been in like 3018, but God planted you right here, right now for a purpose. And so your life is just like a seed. And so matter, no matter where God has planted you, just allow God to grow you. You know, I was thinking about it. Uh, today that, you know, God planted me in the Forrester family, okay? God planted me in the United States of America. God planted me in Missouri. God planted me in Southeast Missouri. God planted me in Fredericktown, Missouri. God planted me at Calvary Church. God has planted me as a husband. God has planted me as a father. God has planted me as a son. God has planted me as a brother. God has planted me as a pastor. God has planted me as a, as a songwriter. God has planted me, and I have the opportunity to do either grow or to just break off from that. And so what you've got to do to, like, be a good seed is you've got to sink into the soil, like, what a seed's got to do is basically you got to be buried. you got to die. And when you'll lay down, and when you'll die, that small seed grows into a huge tree. But you've got to get in the soil first. You've got to get low. You've got to get down. You've got to be like Mary and say, I am the Lord's servant. And whatever you say, may it come true for me. And when you start to do that, <sighs> ripples and waves start to come from your life. So you're not too small to do something big. And I want to end with this, that you're not too, or don't be too big to do something small for God. Okay? Don't be too big to do something small for the Lord because you have no idea, listen to me, you have no idea the ripple effect off of your yes. You have no idea what it is. 
You know, uh, back in the 1850s, uh, there was this, uh, this Sunday school teacher at this little church in Boston, and his name was Edward Kimball. And, uh, and he went off and he was sharing Jesus with this little rowdy teenager. Uh, and, and he shared with Jesus with him a couple of times. And eventually this teenager said yes to Jesus. And so Edward Kimball uh, led this man named D.L. Moody uh, to the Lord. And then D.L. Moody traveled over to England. And, uh, and, and his heart uh, awakened the heart uh, and, 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 and initiated the salvation for, for a young pastor named F.B. Meyer. Well, F.B. Meyer became like this great Bible teacher, and he traveled all the way back to the United States, and he started preaching about around college campuses in the United States, and he won to Christ this student uh, named Wilbur Chapman. Wilbur Chapman attended one of D.L. Moody's meetings in Chicago and became D.L. Moody's co-worker. Wilbur Chapman then employed this ex-baseball player as his assistant, and his name was Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday became a great evangelist, and he preached in Charlotte, North Carolina, well, uh, one time while he was there, uh, he invited this evangelist named Mordecai Ham to come and preach. And while Mordecai Ham was preaching at a tent meeting one night, on November 1st, 1934, there was a young man named Billy Graham that was down there, and he gave his life to Jesus. And, you know, and like we can just think about the life of Billy Graham, you know, and, 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 and the impact that he's made. You know, he's preached live to over 200 million people. Like, that's inconceivable in my brain. I can't even imagine that. And and now, like, uh, like, I'm excited. I'll get to meet Billy Graham someday. And, and it was really cool. This past year, we went to the Billy Graham Library in Charlotte and got to, uh, uh, you know, just experience, like, the impact that one man can make for the, for the kingdom of God. But, you know, Billy Graham, like, his wave started all the way back in 1855 with a Sunday school teacher named Edward Kimball. He maybe didn't think he was doing something significant. He maybe thought it was just something really, really small, but it made a really, really big difference because then, hey, Billy Graham goes, he preaches these crusades all across the United States. They're televised. And then one night, I don't remember what the town was, but there was, there was a young man named Carl Curtin in the, in the 1970s, and he was watching Billy Graham preach in a motel room. He got down on his knees, and he gave his life to Jesus a couple years later. Later, he starts this church. Well, through this church, uh, back in the 1980s, there was a lady ma named Miss Sue. Oh, my gosh, Miss Sue, I love you. And so Miss Sue, she, uh, Brother Carl basically forces her into doing this bus ministry. But she had a heart for the bus ministry and for these kids. And it goes all the way up until the early 90s. And she starts picking up this stinky, nasty kid at 404 East College and just buying him Happy Meals and loving on him. And every time he'd get on the bus, she would say, I love you. And she would give him a hug. And it was just, it meant a lot to him. And now he's preaching to you tonight. And so where did all this start? Like, it didn't ultimately start, like, you know, uh, with Pastor Carl starting this church or Brother Randy sharing the gospel with me or Miss Sue picking me up. It goes all the way back to 1855 with Edward Kimball, just being a Sunday school teacher and just sharing the gospel with people. Amen. And so I don't know. I want to, I want to invite our worship team to come back. Uh, I don't know tonight what God's asking you to do, what he's asking you to risk. And maybe for you, like, you know, being a Sunday school teacher, for example, or just serving somewhere in this church, that's a big risk. Maybe serving with our kids' ministry. And, hey, it is big, a big risk serving with kids, okay? But you can make an impact unlike anyone else if you'll just say yes to Jesus and you'll serve. But I want to leave you with this before we pray. Just this thought. Just this thought. That you are just one risk away from a completely different reality. Just one. And so what is the Lord asking you to risk tonight? What's he asking you to risk? If you want to have a life that makes waves, it starts with just a little ripple. Allowing the Holy Spirit to just in your life. And as you give him that space, he's going to do something incredible. And I believe you get to join in on the wave going all the way back to what Mary said in verse 50 of his wave flows in, or his mercy flows in wave after wave on those who are in awe before him. With heads bowing, eyes closed in this room tonight, we're going to just play a song.
of invitation, and I want to encourage you to respond in some way. Um, and so that may mean that you uh, come to an altar and that you pray. I don't know, maybe there's a husband and wife in this room that you just need to, like, get together and talk because maybe you know that God's been, you know, <laughs> pushing you out of your comfort zone, asking you to step out of the boat and walk onto the water towards Jesus, but you haven't been doing it. And maybe tonight's the night where you know, like, you're like, you know, let's stop uh, resisting the wind. <laughs> Let's just start walking towards him. Let's go. And so you may need to spend a little bit of time, maybe husband and wife together in prayer. Or maybe if you're here tonight with a teenager, maybe you just want to get with your teenager. Maybe you never pray with your, with your son or your daughter. Maybe just take a moment here and just pray with them that God would have his way in their lives. But you also may be in this room tonight you're like, man, Pastor Andy, you're talking about God and his plan for our lives and following the Holy Spirit, but I don't, I don't, I don't know anything about this. So your very first step is just good, simply going to be saying yes to Jesus, this Savior of the world, this Messiah that Mary gave birth to. The reason God sent his only begotten son was so that he would purchase salvation for us. He died on this cross to pay for all of our sins. Why? The Bible says that the wages of our sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And the book of Romans says that if we'll just confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and we'll believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Saved from all of our sins. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's the best news. That, in the end, is all that matters. Is did I say yes to Jesus or did I reject Jesus? So if you're in this room tonight and you've never given your life to him, recognize him as for who he is, as Lord and Savior, tonight is the night for you to simply say yes. Jesus, amen.